everybody, and welcome to an unbelievable wild ride with Steve-O. Gosh, I just learned so much from some of our guests. Like Mark Cuban, he got me in the NFT game. And if you want to see my very first NFT, go to my Instagram right now, and that'll show you where to find it. But I digress. This week's episode taught me the importance of hustling, man. I think I'm going to try to start working a lot harder because this guy did, what, 800 daily vlogs? Sheesh. He really benefited from it, too. Very wise man. Very great episode. Let's check it out. We are good to go, man. I'll fucking dive right in. Are you rolling? All these cameras are going? They're going. Do you remotely operate these things? No, I just, I just went there and did it. Wow. <laughs> I, was, I was sneaky. Ladies and gentlemen, Casey Neistat. Yeah, dude. <laughs> dude, it's it's cool to be in your van, and I've never said that to another grown man before. <laughs> That's cool. I love it, dude. You've met Scott Randolph and Paul Brisky. What's up, Casey? The team. Good to see you guys. I feel like I, li I like the glasses, and I like your mustache, so I'm going to copy you. You got sunglasses on, too, it looks like. Ah, they're just uh, transitions. Um, but yeah, dude, thank you for doing this, man. Uh, I, I slid, slid into your DM to try to make it happen, and... and uh, Fuck, I love that, dude. I really appreciate it. And I also love that here we are parked at the beach because you've become just so passionate about surfing. Yeah, right? You got to... We've DM'd... We had a pretty extensive DM dialogue about yeah, surfing. we did. But, I, you know, for me, it's like I, I left New York City because I wanted to figure out how to, like, relax a little bit in life. You know, like, turn off that 24-hour day work, 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 like, hustler <laughs> mentality. right. And like surfing is such a bullshit thing where it's like when you're out in the middle of the ocean, you can't have a camera with you or even your phone with you. So it's like you don't have to guess like, am I doing this for work or social media? Like, am I doing this for reasons other than I want to do it? And the answer is like, no. So yeah. kind of all I do now is like surf and hang out with my kids. Do you ever like wish because you catch a good wave and you're like, fuck, I wish I had that on camera. Yeah, but like I've seen video of my really good waves. And in my head, I'm like right. Kelly fucking Slater. <laughs> right. And then when I see the video, it's so embarrassing. Yeah, I know what that's that, like. That, like, <laughs> I prefer to just live with it in my head, this beautiful vision of me, like, ducking into, like, a double overhead barrel yeah. rather than having to confront the fact that it's really just, like, an ankle biter wave that I'm standing on a wave storm as it, like, washes over my feet. But, uh, yeah. but, but we both managed to get barreled at Kelly Slater's surf ranch. It took me yeah? two tries. Yeah, two, two, trips. two visits, me two too. Visit. <laughs> me, me too. You didn't get barreled the first time. Fuck no. Fuck, dude. But you've like seen the videos of like Jamie O'Brien with like a six year old girl on the same fucking surfboard <laughs> going so deep in that barrel. Yeah. And then you're out there like a grown ass, capable man, and I right. can't get near it. Right. Yeah. That was the first trip. Second trip, I got it. Well, we just got back from Alaska and he got a couple waves out there. Too. That looked cold. Yeah, dude. Thank you for watching the video. I don't man. know how you like. That seizing up that your lungs does when you jump in the water? Yeah, I mean, when I jumped in butt naked, it, it did shock the system. But what's so incredible about the technology of wetsuits is that, like, it felt no different than surfing in California. When you were fully suited up? When, when we were f full wetsuits, hood, gloves, booties. What about when you were, like, sitting waiting for a wave? It's, no. it's surprisingly warm. Minor. Yeah, really? surprisingly. The feet was, get cold a little after a while, but... Right, Paul, but Paul was, was out there for like two hours, three hours, like yeah. didn't catch crazy. Anything. That was my first time trying to surf in Alaska. <laughs> in Alaska, yeah. that felt, that felt appropriate snow. to you. Yeah, <laughs> it worked. It worked for me. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, it, it was it was just a blast, dude. And surfing was easy. Um, but yeah, dude, I think um, as far as surfing goes, and and I'm gonna take this right into the idea of like of of work ethic, because that's I, I think. There's a lot that's impressive about you, but but surfing's just fucking thankless to me, man. Like, it, it's so hard. It's so demanding. It's like, I, I do it largely just because uh, I feel like the exercise is important, and it's like so, sort of a fun way to exercise. But dude, I, like, I, I hate it as much as I love it. You ever see that Netflix series called Cheer about like the hardcore cheerleaders? <laughs> I did, and I think my girl. Oh, okay, was it's a big amazing. Fan of it's that. about the best like ch acrobatic cheerleaders in the world. These are like Olympic level athletes, and what they're doing is so complex and so difficult. But what took me about that show was how like the the squad, the cheer squad, how much they supported one another. Like we're trying to do something that's so hard here, and if you fuck up, 
I got you. I'm here to support you. I'm here to help you. I'm here to elevate you. I thought you were going to say, if you fuck up, it's going to break my neck. <laughs> well, like that, that's part of it too. But the, the distinction I'm trying to draw here is like surfing too is like the hardest fucking thing in the world. But imagine trying to learn how to be the best cheerleader, but instead of having your whole surf, your cheer squad cheer you on, imagine having them when you just be like, Fuck you. You don't belong here. <laughs> Locals only, yeah. motherfucker. Right. Uh-huh. Like, off the mat. That's my fucking <laughs> like, wave, dude. Right, exactly. Yeah. And to me, like, the, the zero to one in surfing is harder than any sport I've ever tried. And I'm like a total, like my whole life I've been doing athletics. I'm a super fit, super athletic guy. There's nothing I've ever done that's had a harder zero to one than surfing. You want to go snowboarding? Never been on a snowboard in your life. End of the fucking day, you'll be able to skitch your way down a green and you'll be fine. Right. Oh, yeah. You want to surf like six months later, you're going to be able to stand up on whitewash. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or you might die. Yeah, or you might drown. Like yeah. it's going to be one of those two. <laughs> Surfing is such fucking bullshit in that capacity. And the whole time you're learning, there's like a bunch of fucking intimidating bros in the lineup yelling at you for doing everything uh-huh. wrong. Yeah, humiliating sure. you. Yeah. It's a great point, and you're at the mercy of the whether there, nature. whether there's waves. Right. If it, even if there's waves, maybe it's too windy. Like on top of that, just to get to the beach in L.A., uh, you know, it's like an hour fucking drive to get there, and then you got to put on your wetsuit. It's like <laughs> a really it. like just putting on a wetsuit and taking off a wetsuit is it's like an Olympic sport. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, like, that's yeah. what I learned trying to serve. I didn't learn how to serve, but like yeah. Putting on a wetsuit is hard, really hard, right. and taking it off. It's, it's so it's overall it's a motherfucker, and, yeah. and you just sit there like I'm thinking, I hate this, I hate this. Why I'm giving it up? I'm giving it up. And then you catch that one wave, and you know you're on it for like three seconds, and you're like, yes. <laughs> uh huh. You're just paddling back, smiling like, oh, dude, I could do this all day. Yeah, you're like, I, I'm a god. <laughs> right. I am a god, uh-huh. a water conquering god. So yeah, so um, I I feel like you know in in many respects surfing represents for you kind of being like deliberate about like you just said you know uh turning off that workaholic kind of hustle mentality yeah you know so i lived in new york for 20 years and like i I moved to new york with nothing like i was close to homeless as you could be i had a three-month sublet and that was it so i had had no money no job was that still in high school uh, I had dropped out of high school, but that's how old I was. A teenager, I was. I, was, I think I was nineteen when I moved to the city. Okay. Um, moved to the city from Virginia. From Connecticut. Uh, how long were you in Virginia? Like less than a year. Yeah. So if we're backing up even further, <laughs> even further, you know, I left home when I was fifteen, and I moved to Virginia because like my brother lived there. It was the only place I could think of to go. <laughs> so I like ran away from home, moved to Virginia, but then like immediately knocked up this girlfriend of mine. And then moved back to Connecticut and had a baby. And then when she dumped me, I was like, oh, fuck it. And then I moved to New York City with nothing. And like 20 years later, like really successful. Everything's great. And my wife and I we have two babies now. And my son's grown. And it's like we have to leave the city because I'm such like a crazy workaholic that there's no way for me to turn this off. Right. And that was the plan. Like move to Los Angeles and figure out how to chill out and like enjoy life and do all those things. And I tried to do it in New York. And like my last year there was really miserable. Because I wasn't able to, I equate it to like, imagine LeBron retiring from basketball, but he still sits in at every game in uniform with a ball in his hands. Mm -hmm. Like that's what being in New York and Mm -hmm. trying to slow down felt like. Mm. But but did you feel like that because you're doing daily vlogs? No, I felt like that. This was after I stopped that. This was just like my last year there. I felt like that because I only knew one version of New York. Like you only have one relationship with that city. For me, in that relationship over the course of 20 years, it was like, go, motherfucker, go. Mm-hmm. And I tried to turn that off. It's like, um, you know, it's like having a serious relationship and then deciding to just be friends and thinking you can hang out and it's going to be the same. It wasn't the same. Like, I, instead of loving the city, I fucking hated it. I was like, what am I doing here? I hate all this. Right. <clears throat> so, I, I, yeah, that's why I ran away to Los Angeles. And, like, surfing for me is the ultimate stupid indulgence. It's definitely stupid. <laughs> <laughs> would, would, you, so would you go stupid. back to New York and visit, or are you just over it okay. forever? Okay, so... Oh, uh, you're moving back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Okay. It's, it's like not, a toxic relationship, dude. Yeah, no. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about L.A. It sucks. So... I want to go back to New York. Dude, I love L.A. Yeah. I, I don't think anything sucks about L.A. except maybe the traffic. Here's the reason why I think it sucks. And this is, starts to get into like my own psychotic. It sucks for one reason. 
it's not New York City. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what man. I mean? And no matter what this place does, still not New York City. But have you been back to New York to even I see mean, if you like it I, again? I don't need to. I like know what that city is. And like, look, nothing I'm saying here is rational. None sure. of this makes sense. <laughs> it, this is just like, like I, I don't know if like this is um, socially appropriate to say. And if it isn't or this is offensive, I apologize. But I say this with full reverence. I don't say this as a joke. I identify as a New Yorker. Like... And what that means is, like, I feel like a fucking interloper here in L.A. Like, I don't feel like I belong. It's been two years, two and a half years. I've made friends. I embrace this place. I go for hikes every day. I run every day. I'm outside every day. I surf like it's going out of style. Like, I have embraced this place. And I just, like, I feel like I don't fit in. I feel like I did before I moved to New York City or, like, this... Is fine. This just isn't my home. Like this isn't right. So, but I read about you that you were married. You got divorced, and then you married your wife again, right? So it's kind of like the New York relationship. Well, we got it annulled. Okay. You got the divorce annulled or the the marriage? Okay. See, we got. I'm we seeing met. a pattern here. <laughs> but, the, but, but the second time around in New York, you're probably gonna. It's gonna be the Look, best thing the ever. The second time around with the wife, it was like mashed potatoes and gravy, man. Right. We figured it out. Mm. <laughs> right. So maybe like living in LA for these two and a half years, when you go back, like, do you think that's gonna help you sort of yes, find a healthier yes. balance in New York? Well, like, okay, so I don't know what of this is just me rationalizing nonsense in my head, to, so it will make sense. But my general thesis here. Is that like, like you know, sometimes no matter how many times you hit the reset on your like Nintendo Entertainment Center, it just do system. It just doesn't work till you turn it off all the way or you unplug the fucking thing. Mm -hmm. Like I had to unplug, and I did. It's been two and a half years outside that city. We're not going anywhere for a while. Kids enroll in school here. We just signed a lease, but like I got New York in the crosshairs. I want to go back. Same right. same uh, borough. I mean, I want to live in the same building. <laughs> I'm not even joking. But I have this, like, I have these, like, the fuck? I have these, like, what is it, like, delusions of grandeur? Like, I have this have my cake and eat it too plan, which is, like, I'm going to keep my truck in New York City and my surfboards. And, like, Jersey has great surfing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know Ben Gravy? I don't. Ben Gravy is, like, this epic surfer out of um, New Jersey. He, like, lives in... What's it called? That place where Trump had his Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. That's where the casinos were. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Atlantic City has like amazing surf. Yeah. So I have this idea, and I might be just crazy. I'm pretty sure I'm wrong about it, but I think I'll be able to pull it off where I can live in New York City and have like a slower life like I do here, but be in the city where I feel like I belong. It'll never, right. ha it'll never happen. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I can see it happening in New Jersey. You you're are close so enough. right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still going to try. <laughs> Good. I'm struck by the way that you apologized in, in advance of saying that you love New York City and, and you feel out, out of place in L.A. I don't think there's anything controversial about that statement. And I also think uh, it's really remarkable that for, for the research that I did to prepare for this, I, I, it seemed that the most controversial moment of your career was um, like publicly endorsing Hillary Clinton and uh, you're making some completely objective statements about why it would be an awful uh, reality for Donald Trump to take power. Yeah, that was like a really difficult three years of waiting to tell her to say I told you so. <laughs> but yeah, that was especially like with all of these YouTubers being canceled as of late. And yeah. YouTube was getting in real trouble. It forced me to kind of look back at my tenure on YouTube and like, one, I'm super thankful that like I was just a married guy with kids. Yeah. Like that kept yeah. me out of so much shit. And then also like, it's difficult because like I'm friends with a lot of these YouTubers who are in a world of shit because of their being canceled for things that are in a lot of cases legitimate. Like they, you know, wrongdoing has transpired. But when I think back to when I was their age, like when I was in my early 20s when I was in my late teens and like my fucking heroes were these assholes on this show on MTV called Jackass. <laughs> like that's all I wanted to be. It was like the path to success for me is how destructive and sensational can I be? And like I did a lot of really stupid shit. First off, thank you for, for the kind <laughs> words. And, and uh, I don't know if that's accurate, man. My, my sense of uh, of your, you know, 
your career was just the idea of just having a camera in my hand, like doing, you know, your, your first video was like uh, of your son, you know, going to the zoo. Like there was like, uh, and, and congratulations too on being the, the singular reason for the word viral video. How about that? Like it was, and, and it wasn't even you that came up with the word. It was, was it the New York Times? Um, Washington Post. Washington yeah. Post. There you I go. I think, I don't know if that's been validated, but it's such a good story that I will just continue to tell it. Yeah. I mean, this, this is Hank Stuber the... at the Washington Post in 2003. I think that was when the term viral video was coined about that video that my the, brother Van wow. made. Yeah. iPod's the, Dirty Secret. The iPod's Dirty Secret about how they, they had an internal battery which they would refuse to replace. So they, they, their idea was, okay, cool, our battery dies after 18 months. That was Casey's experience. Yeah. And then people are gonna be, they're, they're gonna be like, man, fuck, my battery died. They're gonna buy a new iPod. Mm. Casey took exception to that. He said, hey, uh, replace my fucking battery. Ed calls him up, right? And they, they said, yeah. ah, now you're gonna buy a new iPod. Yeah, r rub me the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and this was, to, like he said, 2003, two years before YouTube came out. And there were six million views of his iPod video called iPod's Dirty Secret. But what I want to know is how, how are those six million views tabulated if the way that the video is uh, viral, so to speak, was just through email? Yeah, so like um, we had a page counter that would flip every time someone clicked on the play button on the quick time. Okay, We'd build like the most basic splash page possible. I remember that, <clears throat> that, that makes perfect Just sense Just a single too. page that had one video centered. And the, you could re click refresh and it wouldn't move the counter forward. But if you click play, it would move the counter forward. You could juke that by watching it 10 times in a row. Right. But like, whatever, if our margins are still small like that's, it, it, it had like a really big impact socially, yeah. like in the world. So whatever the number was, it like that movie w really went kind of gangbusters. That was the first thing that my brother Van and I were ever kind of recognized for. Sure. And then that led to the series on HBO. Yeah. Which, uh, and I heard two versions of this. I heard that the guy who, who uh, you know, sort of greenlit the project to begin with funded it all himself. And then I heard that uh, when HBO bought it, that they gave you two million bucks. But I gotta believe that a large portion of that two million bucks was just to go and and recoup for the guy who invested in it. Yeah, I mean, I can give you specific numbers, but it was like so. The guy who invested in it was a guy named Tom Scott, who's a fascinating guy. He like his sort of early success, his biggest success was. After, I think it was after high school, he went, like his parents like used to do their summers in Nantucket in Massachusetts, you know, a little, mm -hmm. little island there for rich people. And he would paddle around in a rowboat to all the yachts and sell the people on the boats fresh juice that him and his buddy would make in a blender. He turned that into a company called Nantucket Nectars. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, dude, <clears throat> which he sold to, I think, Ocean <clears throat> Spray for... I don't know how much, but like lots, like <laughs> maybe tens or maybe low hundred million, like that kind of number. Hmm. And then after that, he just <laughs> kind of did really interesting media projects. Like he started a small sort of cable news, cable access channel. And we met him through a friend and we did some fun video, like projects for him, with him. And then he's like, I want to do something big. And I think he thought like a feature film. And we're like, no, just like bankroll us for a year. And in that year, we'll make something good. Like, we didn't know what it was, but we just knew we didn't know how to make a fucking feature film. And so he agreed to that. And I think, like, it was around $300,000. So $300,000 is, like, whatever, twenty five grand a month. And I think that's what we asked for. If you give us twenty five grand a month, we can have this done in a year. And we didn't know what this was. And he said yes. And, like, that's an insane amount of money. Mm -hmm. Like, sure. my brother Van and I figured out, like, that covers all of our bills. <clears throat> and we have, like... 18 grand or something a month to just spend on making videos. Like it was the right. biggest, most insane windfall we could ever imagine. And we spent every cent of it just like making little videos. And when we'd meet with him for our checkup, like every two months, we just show him all these little videos. And he just kept saying, keep going, keep going, keep going. Epic. And then after, yeah, like an amazing believer and supporter. And then after like nine months or so, we had all this work. We showed it to a guy named Doug Lyman. He was a big famous like movie director. Like he directed um, 
Born Identity. Mm. Right. And he directed Swingers was like his first feature. Nice. At that point, was it all broken into the eight, no. the eight episodes? No, and that's where Doug comes in. Doug comes in and watches all of it. And we're so intimidated because he's like such a fucking big deal guy. But he doesn't show a lot of emotion. And he watches it and he looks at us and he's like, this is a TV show. Mm-hmm. Turn all those into 22-minute episodes. And we're like, oh, shit, all right. And that's what we did. And we just kind of strung them all together and put an intro and an outro at the end of it. And we called it a TV show. And then, yeah, we shopped it, sold it to HBO for two million bucks. And like the deal with Tom is that he'd get his money back and then his money back again. So it was like he gets his 300 grand and then he gets another 300 grand. Nice. But because he's Tom, he took his money back and he's like, I want to reinvest that other 300 grand into something that we all do together. And then like we all worked together for a while. We did some really interesting things. We like produced a feature film. We did a bunch of successful, good things, but ultimately like his other businesses kind of pulled him away from that. My brother Van moved out to Los Angeles and then I was kind of left in New York and I didn't really want to run this big company. So it kind of petered out. But like, Uh it's like he's one of those people that you look back at your life and you're like, who are the people who stepped in and had like a dramatic fucking impact on my life? And he's one of those people. Right, and and the the guy who... um reminds me of that kind of the same way when you're working in the art gallery and it, and you show him a video like you're filming the guy's art and he's like oh let me see it you were like legitimately scared he was going to chew you out yeah and he was like wow it's yeah. kind of like when i stole my dad's video camera that he won in a, a golf tournament <laughs> I, I made a video and i was like hey dad check this out and he says how did you make this and i told him well i stole your camera and, and he was like fucking Way to go. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, like, you know, my older son now is 23, and, like, when I think about my kids, like, to discover that they have a passion that they're so yeah. excited about that they feel like they have to steal, to yeah. a, like, that, that, like, I couldn't imagine being anything but supportive about that. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. like, I, I definitely think, like, a, a big part of, like, the success that my brother Van and I were able to find in our filmmaking career is because, like, we were really lucky to meet people who recognize that. We yeah. like saw a kind of passion, enthusiasm, and then like stepped up to support that. So when you go into YouTube in 2010, after having an HBO series, after having like the first world's first viral video, do you feel like in, in part like, because I felt this way after making Jackass movies and then going to YouTube, like fucking, you know, I've done these big things and now I'm like, this is the most like demoralizing demotion. Now I'm going to <laughs> upload YouTube videos. And like, all right, did you have any of that? You know, I really think getting on YouTube was the smartest move I ever made, man, because my life is really good today as a result. And you know what I've been enjoying is camping out with my bros and sitting around a fire. It's that time of year, man, and I got this new fire pit that I am absolutely in love with from a company called Solo Stove. And this thing is so portable. I put it right in a little cargo box on the back of my RV, pull it out all the time, man. I think in the last two weeks, I've like had four different nights with big bonfires, burning up pallets from our new warehouse. Oh man, I love it. I want you to try it because it just lights fires so easily. It's virtually smokeless. It's got these holes which let air flow through. Man, it's the best and I've been having a great time. And I want you to try it. Plus, if you do this, you'll get a free stand for the thing, okay? You go to solostove.com and use the promo code Stevo. Again, you're gonna get a free stand for any fire pit that you select and there's a great selection. I'm telling you, you're gonna love this thing. I'm using it all the time. So get yourself one at solostove.com with the promo code Stevo and enjoy the free stand that comes with it. Now let's hear about getting on YouTube. I mean, ultimately it ter- mean, turned out for me to be the best thing in the world because that's the way that the world is now. And to, to have kind of gotten on that wave, like, you know, back in 2013 for me, it, it revolutionized my whole career and it's singularly why I'm like really doing pretty well for myself today. But it was, I had to swallow a pill to do that. Yeah, I mean, there was like, for me, it was a little bit more, like it wasn't that one click moment decision point. It was like, a bunch of fucked up shit happened that drove me to it. You know, so like HBO said no to a second season, which was like, okay, we saw that coming a mile away. 
show had no business being on HBO in the first place. <laughs> I mean, like my HBO show is just nothing but like a fucked up YouTube vlog, but on HBO mm-hmm. before right, YouTube I mean, vlogs were a thing. If, if I understood what I, what I learned about that correctly, it was like highly critically praised, yeah, yeah, but it, just didn't get the numbers. Yeah, and like with it, they put it on midnight on Friday night, so who knows what it would have done if it had been on at a time when people could actually access it. Um, it did really well from a review perspective, but also yeah. it didn't look like an HBO show, and that I understand. Like HBO, everything's so cl- like this was when they were pushing out like fucking Sopranos was coming to an end, Game of Thrones was just on the horizon, and then here's this stupid TV show that we filmed on like eighty dollar cameras from Walmart about us like running around New York and doing silly things and. I get why it didn't work for HBO, but so they said no. And then I took like a couple years and I like developed this new show idea and I pitched really hard. I pitched it to a bunch of people. MTV was sort of close, but I remember like in the end, MTV was like, look, we think that this is amazing, really amazing, but we're not sure it works for TV. Maybe we could put it on our website. And I just remember being like, you motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like I took such offense at that. So like, some other things transpired, but ultimately, like, that show that MTV said no to, that show that I wanted to make, was what became my YouTube vlog. Uh-huh. Which, like, at its height was doing more views in any 24-hour period than, like, every Viacom channel combined. I bet. <laughs> yeah. And it didn't start out the YouTube initiative as a vlogging thing. It was more like shorts and, you know, like... Yeah, no, it, it took five years for me to get my first... 400,000 subscribers in five years. I got 400,000 subscribers and that and was when I, you started vlogging and was then 2015. I started daily vlogging. That's right and daily vlogging like I went from 400,000 to 10 million in like 18 months. Okay, or I, got, I gotta ask like about that. this because I know that you were really sort of uh, Not reluctant, but, but maybe you had some just trepidation about oh, like what this is gonna represent as an like obligation as in like the amount of work and you know I'm gonna lose my mind like and then you said, all right, fuck it, I'm going to do it. Like, I'm terrified from a creative perspective. Like, I, I feel like when I got on YouTube, I thought, I was like, you know what? I'm only going to put out the most quality shit. I want to be like the Quentin Tarantino <laughs> right, of right. YouTube. I, I want that. I want to be the fucking Quentin Tarantino where when I upload a YouTube video, the, the fucking <gasps> internet, the internet rejoices. But then, like, it became just sort of crushing to under to to realize wait how backwards the the youtube consumption mentality is that like they're only going to reward repetition and 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 quantity over quality and i just like thought fuck man i've never been able to bring myself to like i I tried it a little bit but but just like from a creative standpoint i can't put something up every day and i know that for you from a creative standpoint and from like you're like the the cinematographer like the fucking you know the, the scorsese of vlogs and i can only imagine how much you lost your mind yeah you know it's a it's a tricky thing because i think that there's like the technical aspects the algorithm what youtube rewards what youtube wants there's all of that and i think people put a lot of emphasis on that and I think that that's incorrect. I think that that is absolutely a part of it. But I think it's like 10% of it. I think the other 90% is human behavior. And so, like, I wasn't successful because technically I was consistent. I think that the success came from the much more human relationship that, like, being a part of someone's life every single day. And and who was editing all of these? That was, was like, me, 100%. You did, you did, you did 100% Everything. of all of it. Oh my God. Because How long have, did it take you to edit a video? So it's it typically like, it, I got it down to about a half an hour a minute, but it started at a, an hour a minute. So for an eight minute vlog, it'd be eight hours of editing. And in the end, it was, it was a little bit closer to like half that. Every day. Every day, seventy. I, I think I did eight hundred episodes without missing one, or something like that. You moved out. You moved out of New York. You're so frazzled. That I mean, that was in two two different bursts, right? There was the personal vlogging, and then there was the vlogging as the company. Yeah, I mean, sort of. It was just basically like I think there was like three or four different framings of the vlogs where like I quit with like a big yeah. enthusiastic <laughs> "fuck you, YouTube, I'm out of here," and then like three hours later like crawling back in being like you know what actually i'm going to start the vlog again <laughs> like I, I i just couldn't turn it off like i was so right. when you when you have that level of cadence like you are so completely at least i was so completely enveloped in it where it was like 
the tail was wagging the dog a hundred percent. Like I had no idea what my actual life was or who I actually was. I only understood myself as this character. And like you would live every moment of your life. Like I can like, if I put myself there now, it's like, okay, let me think. What did I do today? I woke up. Act one was like arguing with Candace. And then I went for a run. And then like act, act one ends in this drive going from my house in Santa Monica to Manhattan Beach. Act two is like I meet, meet you outside your van, Steve-O, and like we say what's up, we chat about the van, and like act two would sort of end with like us sitting down for this podcast. Act three would be us surfing, get all the shots, need some dialogue, got to get a GoPro out there with us. Then like the episode would end with me sort of going home, and then boom, I need a little bit of me at the house with the family to humanize the episode, so I got to capture that before it's dark, because at night like it doesn't look right. Okay, and then that's it. And then, like, even if I'm pretending to be there and be present and have family, like, family hour with my family, all I'm thinking about is that edit. I'm writing it in my head. Okay, I got more <laughs> shots than I needed for that first act. I don't need to lean into the running so much. I did that yesterday. The audience is going to get bored. I'm going to give 20 <coughs> seconds of running tops, and I'm going to include that one line I filmed into my camera when I stepped on, like, a fucking needle. Like, that's the level of, like, madness that your brain becomes. For sure. And it becomes entirely monolithic. Like, I couldn't think about anything else. When people would be like, hey, can we get breakfast someday? I'd be like, I don't think they're going to know what to do if I point a camera at them. I'd be like, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't meet you. They're like, <laughs> lunch? I'm like, sorry. Coffee? It's like, I literally will not meet you. You're not in the scene, because I can't. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, if it was a person who, like, I couldn't make an hour or two work with for my video, I just didn't meet people. Right. And when people would be like, look, oh, let's get man. together and catch up, I'd be like, how fucking dare you? <laughs> how dare you? When somebody's like, yo, let's go grab a drink. I'm like, are you fucking nuts? <laughs> like, first of all, like by the time it's dark time, those are edit hours. Second of all, a drink might fuck up my brain enough where I'm not be able to edit on time. Like, how dare you? And it became like, that's what I became. Like, I became a monster. And... Yeah, and, and turning that off was really hard because the crazier I got, the more it was sort of rewarded, the more success I found. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, Paul and I, we uh, ed edit all my videos. And, and I think that, like, we can intimately relate to the, the psychotic, like, like, writing and producing in our heads and this and that. And, like, we, we collaborate, collaborate on that. I don't know how you do that all by yourself and every single day so yeah, 800 we don't videos have that. 800 videos daily vlogs yeah the first burst <laughs> was 500 every day yeah which is 18 months it's fucking insane so then this is now i'm gonna get to the question that i've just been dying to ask and uh -oh. Uh -oh. you know apologies if it's uh mm -hmm. if, if it's rude but <laughs> you, you create this this platform called beam which was uh, sort of Snapchat before Snapchat. And, uh, you yes. know, it, it kind of went, it evolved through like sort of different kind of iterations of what it was. Um, you sold it to CNN for an estimated $25 million. And then you referred to its uh, ultimate demise as taking an L. And my question is, how the fuck do you sell a hot cake for 25 million bucks and then that's an L. <laughs> okay, yeah, where's so the L? It was, a, <laughs> it was an L for a couple reasons. It was an L because it wasn't a billion. Okay. It was an L because so much of my team, like when, when, so what's, first of all, let me just, let me give this podcast like a fucking, you guys, this is like an exclusive here. Oh, this wow. is the first time <laughs> someone's asked me about Beam. Really? Since my NDA expired with wow. CNN. You know this is about to get real juicy. But let me ask you, do you have a butthole? You do, don't you? And sometimes you take big sloppy poops right out of it, huh? Well, when you do that, why would you just wipe it around with dry toilet paper when you could wash it properly with a bidet from Hello Tushy. This is my favorite product that I've ever promoted on this podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, it is so refreshing to get done taking a big dump and then just twist the knob on the Hello Tushy bidet and blah! 
it just blasts your butthole with a refreshing clean spray of water and then you grab the toilet paper and when you give it that wet wipe it's so just wonderful and you look at the toilet paper and there's not even any poop on it because you've cleaned your butthole properly if you don't already have this you're out of your mind but the good news is i'm going to give you a deal on it you go to hellotushy.com slash stevo and you get 10 percent off your order plus free shipping Man, don't walk around with a poopy butthole anymore. Use the bidet from Hello Tushy and clean it properly because it feels so good. So one more time, for 10% off your order and free shipping, go to hellotushy.com slash stevo. Now let's get this juicy first scoop. Wow. Not that I'm sitting on any secrets. Like I'm an open <laughs> book. In fact, like... I, it's so fun I can talk about this now, but like there were three different occasions over the course of that four year contract where like CNN called my like people and they're like, yeah, Casey's talking about shit he's not allowed to talk about. And my agent would have to call me and be like, hey, dude, you got to shut the fuck up. And I'd be like, fuck, I'm sorry. Like I'm incapable of yeah, not being too. open. Like I'm just like, that's just the yeah, kind of guy I am. Sure. Yeah. When did your NDA expire? I want to say it was four years, four years after the deal was signed. So like last May or something like that. It might have been three years. But to answer your question, like, you know, I started a tech company because I was really excited about the idea of starting a tech company. And I think we had a great idea for a product. And you said Snapchat before Snapchat. We were Snapchat before Snapchat, but then Snapchat launched Stories. And when they launched Stories, I was like, oh, shit, that's like what we're building, but way better. And they released it before us. So, like, we were Snapchat before Snapchat, but we were also Snapchat later to market <laughs> and we weren't as good yeah. it's like look snapchat look snapchat users i know you love your product and i know it's great but we've got something worse for you just give us a few more months um, if you'll just be patient right if you'll be patient we'll get you something even worse um <laughs> act now you'll pay twice as much right, exactly no i think we like we had an amazing team and we did have something that was really compelling like the thesis of that app was amazing it was like not about filters, it's just about sort of sharing the real world around you. And I think a lot of people spoke to that. And I think since then, we've seen other apps be successful because they represent some version of that. Like people yearn for the truth when everything is like fucking face f shaping filters and stuff. Like you just want some reality. So we had a great product. And CNN's enthusiasm, I think, was naively, I didn't realize how much it was for my reach and my success. Right. You know, like I really pushed them hard and like the original pitch came because Jeff Zucker, the CNN boss, who I think just recently stepped down, he was a great guy, had a wonderful experience with him. But I met with him and he's like, what do I have to do to get you to come over to CNN? And I was like, nothing. I don't, there's nothing CNN has that I'm interested in. I love being on YouTube. And I was like, but your tech sucks. Like your app sucks. Like your technology is garbage. Um, I was like, you should buy my tech company and we should build stuff together. And that's where it came from. And that's what they bought. They bought my tech company. They kept every employee on. And I was really excited about building technology with them. And I think that ultimately, like a big company like that, they've got like shareholders and all kinds of shit that as a nimble startup, you don't have to confront. They need to make money. They have to show how we're making money. So the kind of company that I like to build, which is like, give us three years to figure out exactly who we are and how we're going to make this work, was like, no, no, no. We need profits in six months, sort of mm -hmm. thing. Like, we need revenue in six months. Like, here's how we have to... And it wasn't... They weren't wrong or unfair to ask that or to expect that, but I think that it was a misalignment to take like a really nimble tech startup that has sort of the mentality of, of entrepreneurs and founders in trying to sort of force that round peg into the square hole, which is like a you know, whatever Turner is, a 50-year-old institution. And that's where the misalignment came from. And I think that they tried to save that by, you know, getting rid of my partner and I after a year. They fired Matt and me, which was super amicable. And the people who did it did it right, and it was a great thing. Like, everyone at CNN was fucking cool as shit about it. But then they brought my whole team internal. And, like, I really... <coughs> that, for me, was a big L. Because, like, every single employee at Beam was hired because, like... I vouch for that company and like I felt like in some part they were all there because of me. Um, so you're saying that they let you and Matt go but they sort of stole your... Uh, no, almost the opposite. Like they let us all go 
And Matt and I were really adamant about like you can't shut this, you can't fire the team, and they were really forceful about the fact we're keeping the whole team together. We're bringing everybody in. Oh, uh, so, so so you were stoked on that? Sort of. What I wasn't stoked on, like it was like a, it was like a, a it was nice that everybody wasn't losing their job. It was shitty because everybody signed up to work for a cool ass startup, and now everybody literally has to check in and go into this gigantic building in Midtown and work at CNN. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then like shortly thereafter, like you know, Matt and I had no part of the company. We weren't like really supposed to be interacting with our former employees at all. But, you know, you start hearing stories and people are unhappy and people start leaving and then they broke up this team and this team's not working out and this person could keep their job if they moved so they didn't keep their job. It just sort of fell apart. And, like, the money, the paycheck, fuck yeah, like, big success. I couldn't be more excited about that. Every founding member of the company before the acquisition got paid. My personal assistant, like, a kid (laughs) who was, like, 22 out of college and, like, his job was to, like, make sure the studio lights were always on and, like, deal with admin bullshit. Like, he got, like, a, the kind of check where you could buy, like, a very decent house. And we made sure of that. Like, everybody vests 100% day one. Like, we fought for the team. But in the end, like, I really, and I still to this day, like, really feel like I let that team down. Yeah. Because, like, the success of that company would have succeeded yeah. because of me. And its failure was, it failed because of me. So I can I can have a litany of excuses of why CNN made it really hard to succeed. I think it's all bullshit. In the end, like if I still should have been able to figure out how to navigate that and find success, and I didn't. So in the end, the L is the company culture and like sort of this exciting thing about working for a tech startup just got lost because now those people work for CNN. I think like, that's a nuanced way of getting into. It. I think the L for me was about integrity. Like I didn't feel like I could walk away with my head high. Just because, wow. like, I got a really dope paycheck. That's crazy because, um, we, you know, we were talking to Mark Cuban a couple of weeks ago, and his whole thing was uh, in the dot com bubble. He sold his company to Yahoo, and like right before the bubble burst, he got millions of dollars. And then, like, it, almost immediately after the transaction, what he sold for millions of dollars was like completely worthless i think I and think like, it was closer to billions i think you're right i think you're right i think it might have actually been billion yeah okay. is it 300 million or something like that yeah but it's 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 uh you know ever since then i think it's it's you know hailed as like the best business move ever that mark cuban made it was the in, best business move for him right? in, in unloading this this company before it became totally worthless and i think that, that that's you know on some level very comparable to what you did with beam because it never even really you know like exploded in the first place right. and like you were able to sell it for like you know, arguably more than it was worth and and you unloaded it and then it kind of went away so like to me that's just like a it's win. A, it, i think it all comes down to what's the end game like what is so how do you define success and if the definition of success is like get the fucking bag then mark cuban's the most successful guy in the world if the success if your definition of success is something different from that then it's, you know, then it's, I think, a little bit more complicated. And, like, my definition of success for that company was a little bit more than, like, you know, me getting that CNN bag. And, like, no regrets. I'm very proud of what we did. Like, Like, one of the things I never talk about is the fact that, like, when you're like the CEO, when you're like the founder, you raise all this money, you, you write, like, once a month, once every two months, these updates, all of your investors. And they're formal, and, like, truth be told, my partner Matt mostly wrote them and then sent them to me and I would put them into my own email and send them because I'm like you know I can barely read and write over here I got a a D minus in 10th grade English (laughs) um Matt got college man that kid's smart and and then like so you have to send these monthly updates like here's what we're up to here's where we're struggling here's where we're succeeding I just stopped sending those because the company was just doing so poorly this is before CNN bought us we were doing we were out of money we were just fucked Users were dropping off, and I just stopped sending those. And when you stop getting those, that means the company's going tits up. And then six months later, I, got to, I had to call all the investors, every single investor on the list. And I was calling them to let them know that we had sold the company and how big their returns were. And that day, to me, like that is the benchmark of success. All these people, mm-hmm. whether they're just like, you know, Venture capitalists who are only interested in a return or they're much more thoughtful people who are like, I believe in you, Casey, and I want to support you. They all looked at me and decided 
I believe in this guy enough to write him a check. And the fact that I was able to deliver on that to every single person was a huge deal. Like Fuck to me, yeah. that is the that moment was the ultimate success, much more so than the paycheck. So yeah. when you when I talk about like an L at Beam, like again, I got that paycheck was great, but like if the paycheck had been a fraction of that, but like we had built something that to this day is still thriving, and all those employees like went on to bigger and better things or felt great about what their contributions were. That would have like I'd, I'd sleep with a bigger smile at night. But how do you know the employees aren't thinking that right now? Th they might be, but I know that like in the year that, in the years, months after we sold the company, whether they were working for us under CNN or they were working directly at CNN under a different boss, that it wasn't the same level of enthusiasm and satisfaction that it was working for a nimble startup. We're actually a part of something that that is kind of your own, that you have a kind yeah. of ownership over. Because yeah. they all had a bunch of barcodes on their necks, Scott. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, Scott, it's also, it's also like in that sp space, and I, I haven't had a, I've been out of the tech game for five years now, but like then, and I'm sure it's the same way now, like mobile app developers that can deal in video are the most sought after programmers out there. Like they're, they're so exclusive. We had to talk a lot of our employees into moving to New York from the West Coast where they lived. Like yeah, wow. every single one of them could have left working for us on a Monday and gone and gotten three X the paycheck on a Tuesday from from Facebook, which was just 12 blocks north from us. Like they could every one of them could have done that. And every one of them said, no, I love this company. I believe wow. in these guys. I love Matt. I love Casey. I want to be a part of what they're building. And like the fact that I wasn't able to deliver on that, like. That, that sucks. That sucks. These are people that are all fucking smarter than me and capable, more capable than me and that have like built their careers out. And like, that's part of their gamble too. They, they knew they were taking <coughs> for a chance, sure. but like, man, would I have loved for those, every one of those people who took a chance on me for me to be able to just like give them those kind of dividends that I was able to give those investors. Mm -hmm. Do you have another startup in you? I don't know. I mean, that's like a, it's like a much bigger conversation, which is like, you know, now I'm sort of confronted with this fact that I'm 40 years old and I've got money, which is weird. It's like, you know, I used to be on welfare and now I've got money. And like, I don't need to work for money right now. So therefore, like, where's the motivation? And if you like dig deep enough in yourself, like where I've landed is like, I can either go work for money or just like hang out with my two-year-old. So like today she and I like played in the garden and like, tried not to prick our fingers on roses and then we ate like candy that mm. was way more fun than starting a company so wow. yeah nice. so like that's kind of where i am right now is like i don't know when you're faced with the question of like you can do whatever you want today what do you want to do every day for me is like i want to play with my kids and go surfing yeah it's and crazy. i it's you probably just do that until you don't want to do that anymore well that's like that's where we you know come back to new york city it's, how how often are you uploading YouTube videos? Never. <laughs> Never. Never. I've uploaded once in the last five months. All right. Well, let me ask you this. How much was that Ethiad plane ticket? It's the most <laughs> expensive plane ticket in I the think world. I it's like 50 grand. Unbelievable. But, it, but like the whole story. <laughs> I, saw, I, saw, I started watching like I got to the video. So I didn't want to. Did you, did you say how much it was on the video? I might have. I don't remember. But it. Three this, room suite. <laughs> On the plane. On each... an airplane and, and where are you flying to? Fuck, Abu Dhabi. You're like, you're yeah. like Palm Springs. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, so it goes like this. So How do you get those, dude? So I've always been obsessed with like first class. Yeah. Because I spent the first like 10 years of my real career where I was traveling nonstop. Whatever's cheapest. Middle seats in the back on whatever the shittiest airline is. That's what I fly. And like the more you pass by those seats up front, you start to get a little obsessed. And I went through all of these like different versions of obsession. I like, finally figured out how to almost always fly first without ever paying for it. That was like mid 2000s case where I didn't have any money, but I got really good at faking it. Wow. And then like, and I started to find success and I'm still sort of obsessed with flying even though I don't get on planes anymore. But what happened was, I think it was 2016, YouTube, at the height of my daily vlogging, YouTube said, come be a speaker at our brand cast, like our annual summit in Australia. And I said, I can't, it's a two day flight and I need to make a daily vlog. And I was like, I'll tell you what, if you fly me through Dubai so I can go on this fancy plane, I can make videos about the flight. And they're like, sure, no problem. <laughs> Except for they bought me a fucking business class ticket. 
not first class. And I was like, okay, I'll it's make like two this. bedrooms instead of three. Well, that was the thing. It's like, <laughs> they like sent me business class. I was like, shit, I said first. And then like, I was like, wow, they spent like 10 grand on this ticket. And I was like, I'm not going to say anything. Like I can't complain. <laughs> like who the fuck am I? So I made the video about flying their business class and it was like fine. And people watch the video and stuff. I'm flying back also business class. The airline pulls me aside. They had seen my video and they wanted me to try out their first class experience. That's how I got the free fucking first class on the flight. So does that mean you had to turn around and go back after your return? N no, it was a flight from Dubai <laughs> no, but, back. Oh, yeah, that's right. So I'm oh, flying gotcha, the gotcha, return gotcha. flight. I'm flying back from the States, like my return flight. They saw it when I was in Australia. Right. Because I'm uploading like, I shoot the video today, it's so, posted so, tomorrow. So they, they grabbed you, they grabbed you in on, the your, on your connection in yes, Dubai. literally like <laughs> going down the run, going down the shoot, and I got all my cameras Damn. and shit, I'm talking to myself, and like, excuse me, Mr. Neistat, and I was like, fuck, please don't say I can't film on this flight, please don't say I can't. <laughs> and they're like, we have we were up, able to upgrade you to first class, and I'm like, me? I was like, this is like all, this is like a culmination of every dream I've ever had. <laughs> all rolled into one. So that's what happened. And then I made that video and that video did like 70 million views. So then immediately after that, like, I don't know, six months later or something like that same airline, that airline's called, what's it called? Etihad. No, em Emirates. Oh, Emirates. I'm not even at Etihad yet. Emirates announces some new first class situation. Everybody on you on the Twitter is like, Casey, you should check this one out. And sure enough, like they reach out and they're like, Hey, you want to try our new first? And I was like, I do, I do. <laughs> so they're like, we only fly from Zurich though. And I was like, Oh, I'm, I've got no plans to be in Switzerland. Like who the fuck am I? Some international like banker man of mystery. And they're like, <laughs> we'll bring you to Switzerland. Great to put you on plane. And I was like, great, I'll go to Switzerland. I'll ski. So they, flew me in their plane. I remember getting on that plane and I was like, they're showing me all the first class cabins and no one's in them. And I'm like, whoa, when do you board the rest of the flight? And they're like, no, we haven't actually launched this yet. You're the only person in this cabin. And I was like, oh, uh -oh. shit. Whoa. Okay, so that was number two. <laughs> then we get to the ultimate, which is this Etihad. It's called like the apartment because you get three rooms. You get a bedroom. <laughs> You get a bathroom with a shower in it, and then you get a living room with a big screen TV, and then you get a hallway, which connects all of it. <laughs> it's bigger than this, without a doubt. Square it's, footage wise, it's bigger than this van that we're in it's right now. It's bigger than my studio in Marina del Rey. Yeah, it's fucking huge. <laughs> and the difference was they paid me for that. Like that wow. was a paid job. And the thing is, had they offered me the job without the paycheck, I would have said yes. If they had offered me the job <laughs> for a discounted <laughs> ticket price, I would have paid them <laughs> to get on that plane. And they flew me and like, I was like, you know, very sort of meek about it, but I was like, you know, I'm, I'm vegan. If there's, if there are any options, I get on the plane, they have this menu and like my name is embossed in the leather, leather cover. <laughs> and it's like menu, a la Casey Neistat, and then in parentheses, everything's vegan. And it was like options, vegan options, like six of them. And then they just brought me everything on the menu because they had made it all for me. Like it was so insane. Wow. And then like you get in the bed and like, I was so overwhelmed by the idea that I'm laying in a bed on an airplane <laughs> that I wasn't able to sleep. Like it was just too exciting. <laughs> it's just like the shower, like how the shower works. There's literally a timer it goes from green to red. But like, I think I had six minutes of showering, but six minutes of showering is also three two minute showers. So I broke those showers <laughs> up. I was showering the whole flight home. No, that was really exciting. But like that video did, you know, 30 million views or something. So I, I don't know what, how, I don't know how to equate that value, but you have to imagine that it was a much better deal for the airline. How do you make a commercial that gets a 10 minute right. commercial yeah. that gets 30 million views for yeah. the price of a stupid ticket? Right. Fuck, man. Amazing, dude. How that's so fortunate. You became the like the first class guy, you know, like what a great lane to, to be in, you know? What's what's crazy is that prior to becoming that guy, I remember watching all of these first class videos because I was obsessed with it. And I'm like, all these videos sucks, but they have that crazy views because anyone who's ever been on an airplane is forced to walk by those yeah. seats, and you're like, God, I wish I knew everything about those seats. And mm -hmm. I was like, if I ever get the opportunity, I'm gonna go ape shit. And I had like this list in my head of what's wrong with every airline review. And it's like the camera's too narrow, so it looks tiny. It's claustrophobic and the lighting's terrible. So like on those flights, I had requested, like I made sure it's a day flight. 
Mm. So the lighting would be good. Lighting's everything. Oh, wow. Like dark on an airplane does not work. I tried to do it. I've made a couple of videos where it's dark. It looks gross. And then like all these, it has to be on a tripod. You can't handhold the camera. On an airplane, there's too much action. If the camera isn't fixed, you're stressed out when you're trying to watch it. You can't see what you're looking at. So like get that shot. Like oh all of God. this shit I obsessed over. And if you go and walk back and watch any of those videos, you realize that like every shot, like that Etihad, no, Emirates plane that I was the only person in the first class cabin. I was the first person to fly in that cabin and I did major damage. So I was like breaking through the ceiling panels so I could mount a camera up there. <laughs> and I did that in all these different locations. And like I, I was trying to be as respectful as possible, but I was like, the shot's kind of more important than me not scratching the wall here. And I would bet that they would agree with that because that video did insane views. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> you know? It's so good, man. What's your favorite airline? That's so hard. Um, I mean, I like JetBlue because they're nice. Like those those um, Middle Eastern airlines are insanely nice. But that's like, that's like saying, oh, Rolls Royce has more comfortable seats than my Honda. And it's like, okay. But like the, my old Toyota was the best car I ever owned, even though it's not as fancy as a Rolls Royce. I don't know Rolls Royce, but I'm just trying to make a bad analogy here. Well, mm -hmm. I, feel like, I feel like other parts of the world besides america they really have the customer service down at like a hotel like good evening sir how are you yeah, how they may care I, how may i assist you like in japan they bow to you and they yeah. just want to accommodate your every needs here they're just like fuck it what do you want yeah and it's it's unfortunate but like i think like my the hardest part of flying on planes is like like my wife right now is booking a trip back east for this summer with the kids and stuff and she's flying with her mom I'm driving. I'm literally going to drive my truck mm. from LA to New York because I don't want to fly. Um, not that I'm against it, but like if I had the opportunity to drive, I'd much rather drive. It's tough, man, with the fucking masks on the plane, dude. Mm -hmm. It's so like the reason why I'm I'm I have such like anxiety about flying is not because of like I'm worried about getting sick. I have my vaccine. I'm I'm not worried. About, it's everybody else. Like it's that guy that yells at that lady for not wearing her mask. Like, I don't want to be around that energy. Yeah. Mm. You're like stuck in this tube, 30,000 feet in the sky with like 200 people. And like, if hmm. any percentage of them are angry at any other percentage of them, like, I don't want to be a part of that. And that fucking stress, it freaks me out. Wow. Yeah, yeah dude. Have you always been like that? Just like, you know, be careful no. the energy you, you hang out no, with. No, I've definitely gotten super weird as I've gotten older. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, a way to sort of sum up Casey the way he's always been. I think it's just one word. It's just hustle. You know? Like, yeah. Well, I'm trying to turn that off, Steve-O. Yeah, actually, yeah. I, I'm curious about that. So with turning off this, like stopping the daily vlogging mm. to reset your brain to just be in the world and not be thinking about a vlog all the time, like how long is that transition and were, were there some things that like surfing where it's like you do it because you love it you're not even filming were there some things where you're like oh wow i actually like doing this because now i'm not filming it but i'm still doing it like oh i didn't even realize i actually really like this one thing you know yeah like my wife is a good example of that <laughs> i'm not even joking i'm uh -huh. totally fucking serious like, like spending time with her but f no we were on. on the like verge of divorce the entire vlog chapter of my life like right on the edge of divorce and I would do everything I could to appease her and I do mean appease because I didn't I wasn't invested in like fixing the relationship or anything like that I just needed her to like not be pissed at me for today mm. so I could put her in the vlog mm. and that sounds it's like the most <laughs> awful thing but I'm just being honest like that's sure. literally what it was and now like I like hanging out with her like I tweeted a, after I quit vlogging that like been spending time with my wife. Turns out she's pretty cool. And like everybody's like, <laughs> LOL, ha ha. And I'm like, no, I'm fucking totally serious. And so stuff like that, socializing. Like I never socialize. Like I literally cut every friend out of my li life out of my life unless they were good on camera. Because like I don't, I don't have time to hang out with friends. Like I need to make content. I agree with that completely. Like, and, and, and I mean, that are good on camera? he's like, well, he no. cut out all his friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just like you know, the idea. There's certain people. They're like, hey, you know, let's hang out. And and I, and it's not a question of whether they're good on camera. It's just like I, I, I'm on this planet. I'm I'm in this body, like to make shit happen. And like, if if a person isn't contributing to like me accomplishing some kind of a goal that matters to me, then fuck no, I don't want to chat over dinner. You know, it's not about being on camera; it's just about being like 
goal oriented. It's unproductive. To yeah, just sit about there and being just productive. Eat a meal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have no interest in a, in a conversation or spending time socializing <laughs> because that doesn't that doesn't advance a, a, a fucking objective, a goal. Is that something you ever hope to turn off, or you're just riding it? You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, like and I feel so strongly about that. And mm -hmm. then, but, but the difference is like with my, with my girl, I'm in a relationship with Lux and like, I'm like, man, like and with you guys, like we don't have to be working. I love being around you guys, Yeah. but I do not want to bring more people into that circle. <laughs> I just don't have any interest in that. I only want to work seven days a week for the rest of my entire adult Scott life. Scott and I both. I'm yeah. so different from you guys. You guys have but kids? We talked about that. No, no. I got a vasectomy because I'm so sure that I don't want to have kids. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I just like working so much that like that's all I want to do because I think that's how I get my validation. But I also enjoy it. And like people are like, "Dude, you want to hang out? At, you know, go to a restaurant?" I'm like, I'm in bed by like eight thirty nine, so I can wake up at like four or five to field New York emails. Or like, there's a guy in Australia <laughs> that we like. I enjoy the shit out of that, and I only want to do that. Yeah. And I, so I think that that's the answer. It's like you got to figure out what you love doing. And there's a couple of things that like I always subscribe to really like emphatically, very consciously. Um, one of which is like I, my goal in life is to do only exactly what I want to do at any given time. Like there's this Woody Guthrie quote that maybe Bob Dylan or somebody like that stole. <laughs> but it goes like, the definition of success is to wake up in the morning, go to bed at night, and in between, do what you want to do. I think he said the definition of freedom is to wake up at night, go to wake up in the morning, go to bed at night, and in between, do what you want to do. And to me, it's kind of my ultimate. So, like that hustle, especially that hustle that like I really promoted and glorified and romanticized in like my vlog and everything that I represented. And like you're doing these TED talk looking things. Oh yeah, too. like it never said no to anything. I was just going, like and, 10 and, and jobs. I, and I love how you, you said like, here's where I am, here's where I wanna be. And in between that is just a whole bunch of work. Yeah. And when I, when I see you say that, I'm like, fuck yeah, there is. <laughs> but you, you have how many subscribers on YouTube? Tw almost 12 million now. Like that, yeah. So so would you have the same mentality of like where well, I only want to do what I want to do if you had like 50,000 or no, and is that's, there what, a that's what I'm driving towards is like uh, This clarity that I've always had in my life in the last video I made in New York City Where where I actually move out to California like I, I talk about this I was so aware that like that hustle was a sprint for me Like I'm a big runner. I used to be a competitive endurance runner. Like it's a literally compete and the, you got your sprints and then you've got like your your longer races and like I, I was competitive in triathlons at sprint distance i would win those but the ironmans 140 mile race my only objective was to finish confidently so therefore like it's about pacing and about being smart i always understood like the hustle part of my life the new york city chapter like that whether it was Beam, my startup, whether it was a startup I had before that, the startup I had before that, whether it was my HBO series, my YouTube series, that was a fucking sprint. And the finish line, at the end of that, is like, if I can get across this finish line, I want a wife, I want kids, and I want to chill the fuck out, and I want to effectively retire when I start my family. Mm. And that was the dream. And it was like, that came from an, an amalgam of things. Like, one was the fact that, like, when I had my first kid, I was 16 years old, and, like, I tried to be the best dad I could, but like I'm 16 and I'm getting fucking free milk and diapers from the state because I can't afford to buy my kid milk or diapers. Like you try, but I knew that I wasn't the dad that I, I could have been because I had all of these limitations around me. So I always had this idea that like I will sprint until I can get to a place where I can just fucking chill out. My dad was like, I talked to him yesterday, he's still working. You know, like he's barely retired and he's 70 almost. And like I never remember anything from my childhood but him working. So that was what leaving New York was. Like that last year in New York where I said I was miserable it's because I wanted to do what I'm doing now, which is just that like, I, I have the money. Like I got that fucking bag. Like I, I got the YouTube subscriber. Like I did everything I wanted to do. They're all ticked off the list. The thing that's on the list right now that's next <coughs> up is like really just like chilling out, doing what I want to do, enjoying my life and like spending time with my family. And the privilege that that is is not lost on me. Like to say that even out loud, I'm uncomfortable admitting that I get to have that life because who the fuck I'm 40 years old yeah who the fuck gets to have that at 40 who my dad re literally retired six months ago and he still doesn't have that mm -hmm. he like he's Oof. trying to find a part-time job right now and he's like it'll just make things a little bit easier like he doesn't have that 
and he's staring at his twilight years. Like, I have that right now. Like, I'm totally fucking healthy and fit. There's nothing wrong with me. My wife's still hot. Like, we're still young. Like, <laughs> and, and I have that. That's insane. That's fucking insane. <laughs> so to not hit the brakes and be like, I fucking did that. Yeah. But to have something which is like, no, now's the time to hustle. It's like, no, motherfucker. I got nothing left to prove. And what's crazy is like, for me, I'm such a, a like a guy of extremes. I'm so scared of like fame right now. Like I'm so reluctant. Like part of the reason why I'm struggling to make YouTube videos right now is like, I don't want to put myself out there. Like I don't want to be recognized. I don't want people to talk to me. I don't want people to look at me anymore. Like I did that. That was cool. I tried it. Like I got to try fame. Fame is amazing, right? No one's trading it in. No one's trading it in. <laughs> but like, but like Good I, answer, dude. I, I, I just wanted to try it. And like, I got to try it. Like I got to be like a somewhat famous, like sea level celebrity for a minute. And I, I didn't really like, okay, let's turn that off. And it's like, it kind of bummed me out that I don't know how to turn that off besides like trying not to further it. But like, I got to try that and that's really special. I got to know what it's like to run a company. I got to do all these things. And like, I just need to appreciate that because I don't know if like maintaining that cadence is, is I do know that it's just not interesting to me right now. Yeah, mm. cool. It's epic, dude. I, 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 sorry to cut you off. I know you're going to say something, but I was, th there's a guy in the, like the thirties, he interviewed like all the billionaires of the day and he, he, he they asked him what the definition of success was and it was peace of mind. Yeah, and I always liked that, yeah. you know, because no matter how, he's like, no matter how rich these people were like back in the day, he's like, they literally almost lost their mind at the end of their life trying to figure out what to do with their money and give it away to different organizations or people that it wouldn't kill them because it's just so much for somebody to handle, you know? Yeah, what's that? Dale Day-Lewis, um, There Will Be Blood? Yeah, yeah. It's literally the fucking movie is that in this guy's pursuit of money or his ver all, the only version of success that he understood, he lost everything, every person that was close to him, his family, his son, his partners, his friends, everything. And the movie literally ends with him sitting by himself over a dead body. And he looks <laughs> to the camera and says, I'm finished. And like, <laughs> there's not like, that's not that far of a fucking abstraction. Like there, that's mm -hmm. real. He so drank like, their milkshake, dude. To kindly, I drank your milkshake. <laughs> to like constantly be gut checking. How do I define success right now? Like that Ted talk you're talking about, I defined success then really acutely because it was something to, for me, success right now is like, can I be a good dad? Can I be a good husband? And can I be present? And that's such like a wishy-washy fucking new age <sighs> stupid thing to say. But like, I never got to do that. And I look back at those hustle years that like, I'm so guilty of romanticizing. And like, the reality was like, there's a lot of glory. The glory is all anybody saw, including me. But the reality of the day to day was fucking misery. It was shutting out anyone. Like, you want to have a conversation with me? I'll look you in the eye and nod my head. All I'm thinking about is how the fuck can I get out of this shell conversation? Of a man. So I can. That's all it was. It was right. completely uh -huh. artificial. Um, it's interesting, and I, I don't. I don't need to like get go uh, off on a big thing. But for me, probably the most uncomfortable question is, "Are you happy?" You know, and, and it's probably like the definition of success is to be happy. Yeah. And when people ask me if I am happy, I think. For, for many, many years, I, it just made me uncomfortable and I'd be like, uh, you know, but then I realized what my answer is. And the answer is, no, I'm not fucking happy because what the, what's that going to get me? Like content, <laughs> content, and I'm going to fucking like stop, like lay down, like, oh, I don't need to do anymore. You're like, fuck no. Like, I'm, I'm so grateful that I'm not happy because that's the, that's the drive. That's the fire under my ass. I'm not, I never want to be fucking happy. Fuck happy. He's about <laughs> to drink everybody's milkshake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. You know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I, I love that, that you're so you know, serious about this, you know, like that you are content. They, they, now you just want to chill. And maybe I can get there one day, but... Uh, well, that, that's why the first question I had was like, you guys have kids, is because I think it... Uh, kids aren't for everybody, believe me. Not entirely sure my mother should have had kids. <laughs> Thanks, Mom, I appreciate it, but if we could go back and do it over again, maybe skip the whole kids thing. Um, <laughs> that said, like, when you have kids, there's oh an, my God. there's an instant and in that instant for the first time in your whole fucking life your priority is no longer yourself like mm -hmm. i don't care how much you love other people how much you love you know 
relationships, anything you have in your life, there's nothing that can sort of fill that void that is like you are literally responsible for this human that you created that is completely fucking vulnerable. You're 100% on the hook. And that shifts your thinking. So I, I think, Steve, like the reason why I can so aggressively pursue a kind of contentment or happiness is only because I have these this lens to look through and it's a lens of like these these three kids yeah. that I have. I mean, if only every parent felt that way. <laughs> you know? I don't think they have the luxury. I think most have to work and like deal with realities that I'm just really lucky to have fucking manipulated well, right. life around. And like, I, I think that there's there are too a lot of parents that just don't see it or they, they just you know, remain so self-absorbed and not like, you know, they're just shitty parents and, you know, like, yeah. I think you should, you have to get a license to catch a fish. I think you should have to get a license to become a fucking parent, but you don't. And what are you going to do? It's making a baby is so easy. It takes me like 15 seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tops. But dude, I just, you know, if we, we've been going forever. We should probably surf. Um, I, I just wanted to say, you know, as, as sort of an overview, um, just want me to kiss your ass a little bit. I, I admire you, dude. I admire. I, I, that. I admire. I admire the spirit of everything that you've done, and and, and I really feel that the spirit overall is just, there's such a positivity, and and what's unique to you and your spirit is that the positivity is authentic, and I say that with just such disgust for all of the <laughs> for all of the artificial oh let me get the views and the right. likes and they're by saying hey you can do anything that you put your mind all of this fucking artificial positivity just hmm. makes my stomach turn so much and and you know the the old saying actions speak louder than words you know like when uh when you're doing your ted talk and you're talking about like hustling and like i say yes to everything and if it involves a camera like i'm in and like just the all of that man like i just see the that there's actions behind like your positivity that it's not artificial that it's authentic and now like here you are like evolving you know like you're not you, you say like oh well, that's that was me during my new york phase that was me all these days and it's great that you can evolve through your phases and be authentic and it's a fucking honor to know you dude i appreciate that They're very kind words from you steve -O. yeah well i mean it fuck yeah all right dude let's fucking surf let's do it <laughs> <laughs> thanks that was good dude that was that was super fun, fun. Yeah. <clears throat> what a cool dude and let me tell you, he's a rad surfer too, man. We paddled out right after that, and I did not catch a single wave, and he was just catching them all over the place, riding them all. Dude, it was really pretty impressive. And uh, I was inspired as well. So very shortly after uh, getting out of the water, and <laughs> so I came up with the idea, what if I did a daily vlog between now and roughly when Jackass 4 comes out? I mean... So I reached out to somebody who I had in mind and said, you want a job? And they said, yep. So it looks like I might actually try it, dude. I might actually try it. And why not, man? Get inspired by guests. Like I said, I got that NFT going, man. You can, you can check it out. Uh, <laughs> life is good, man. All right. 